Mm-hmm. I'm going to stand in for you, so get the camera in focus. <laughs> We're going. Okay. So, welcome everyone to the American Chemical Society Greater Houston Section Seminar for October. Um, my name is Crystal Young. I'm the ACS GHS Chair Elect. Um, I hope that all of you are having an excellent National Chemistry Week. Um, we are celebrating um, today with a seminar from Sebastian Frommelt. He uh, comes to us from the Department of Public Safety and he is a forensic analyst and will be giving us some information um, from, or so his perspective from the bench of, uh, of analytical chemistry. Um, so without, I don't want to tell his story because he'll tell it better than I will. Without any more ado, um, Sebastian Frommel. I had to grab this on the way up because it is one of the things we're going to be talking about. Cool. <laughs> so, um, my name is Sebastian Fromhold, and as the uh, name there shows, I am a JSPS. Uh, that will be explained in just a moment. I am part of the Department of Public Safety, their crime labs. There are 13 crime labs around the state in the DPS laboratory system. The Houston Region Lab serves a 23 county area in Southeast Texas. So everything over to Jasper and Beaumont, out to Waller, north to Huntsville, out to uh, Livingston and Woodville, and south we're going down to Galveston and Fort Bend County. Those are the main areas <clears throat> that we serve. The laboratory has several sections, controlled substance or drugs. It has a DNA section, a firearms and a trace evidence section. Also the regional breath alcohol testing program is run out of that particular office. My background, hook em, moo. Uh, everybody understands that. From 1984 to 1989, as technical supervisor for the breath alcohol testing program. Breath alcohol analysis takes place under the auspices of the Office of the Scientific Director with the Department of Public Safety. Uh, they certify instruments, they certify operators, and all testing that is done with the breath alcohol is done on those certified instruments at certified locations by certified operators. You can't just walk in and use it and have that test hold up in court. Technical supervisor does not actually supervise the individuals, but is actually more of a manager. Manages what they do to make sure that they follow the regulations, follow the guidelines that are in place to ensure the validity of the testing. 1990, I went to the Houston Police Department Crime Lab. I have to emphasize this is before they had their scandals. Their scandals all happened after I left and not because I left. I want to emphasize that very much so. Uh, Houston Police Department is where I picked up my controlled substance training or drug training, but I did blood alcohol, breath alcohol, urine drug, blood drug. went into a sales position. If you are ever in a situation where you need to do sample preparation, especially of biological samples, and you have a big old tub of blood <laughs> or a big old tub of water, they do a lot of environmental preparation as well, have a big old tub of urine, and you want to figure out what drugs are in there, solid phase extraction cartridges are the way to go gives you the best cleanup. Liquid-liquid extractions tend to be too polar. They goober up the instrument, make cleaning a mess, but the solid phase extraction is wonderful. And the silyl reagents there are derivatizing reagents. Some of the compounds that you're going to extract as a free drug from a sample may be a little bit too hydrophilic or too polar to analyze properly. 
So you derivatize them, you find an acidic proton, you take the proton off, you add a trimethylsilyl, and that makes it hydrophobic enough and less polar that you can get a good chromatography, sharp, well-defined peaks, rather than broad peaks at very low levels. <clears throat> Got laid off from that position because, well, at the time nobody was buying stuff. <laughs> and so I ended up going back to the HPD lab as an evidence handling technician. Evidence handling technician basically means strong back, weak mind. Uh, you are packing anything from a single envelope that contains a single rock of crack cocaine all the way up to the biggest case I ever handled was about 11,000 pounds of marijuana that they got out of an asphalt truck. So the stuff is covered in asphalt. These compressed bundles are wrapped in aluminum foil, latex, powdered industrial bleach, and then more tar. That was not a fun one. <laughs> What I thought would be my retirement job, I went on to the Pasadena Police Department for 14 years. They decided to close down. I can give it a full editorial on why it's inappropriate for this setting, though, because there would be profane language involved. And uh, the bottom line was it was a heck of an experience because I got to work with about five or six of the best people I've ever been around. Uh, the advantage to being a small lab like that, which we had seven people total, <clears throat> was the fact that you can actually do what you need to do to improve methods, to not just produce results, but you can actually improve what you do to get the results quicker, with less time, uh, more definitive analyses, things like that. And I have now, for just shy of five years, been with the Department of Public Safety. And all of this, you ask them, what are you talking about with JSPS? Well, that's what we're going to say now. <laughs> I've been doing this since 1984. I work with people that were born after I started my professional life. <clears throat> that is sometimes a little disconcerting. And I remind them that I've played with dinosaurs. <clears throat> I have indeed played with dinosaurs. When I started in forensic chemistry, we had little to no instrumentation. We would do colored sp uh, spot tests where you mix the reagent. If it turns a color, it's an indication of a particular type of compound. We would do thin layer chromatography with two to three different solvent systems, we would do microcrystalline. That one's fun because you get to play with gold and platinum. Those make the prettiest crystals. If we had an instrument, it was a UV. <laughs> if we had a mass spec, it was a DuPont. That takes up basically the amount of space as two of those tables is a floor model and requires auto-tuning two to four times per day. So if you ran two to three samples without having to tune, you were darn lucky. About that time, the tabletop mass spec began becoming available. We're talking late 70s, early 80s that started coming in. The quadrupole mass spec on a tabletop model was one of the greatest advancements to help forensic labs because it made it affordable for them to obtain ah, the magic screen. <laughs> and so the JSPS, because the field that I work in likes honorifics, it likes titles and memberships and associations, you will many times see someone with a name on their business card and about five sets of initials afterwards. I'm a BS in chemistry. 
That is a degree which is appropriately named. <laughs> you learn basically how to look stuff up. You've been exposed to the information and you know where to go to get that answer again if you need to. So I am JSPS, just some poor schmuck. When stuff rolls downhill, it rolls downhill to the schmuck. <laughs> Not creative enough to come up with that on my own. I borrowed that from Jeremy Levin, who wrote a book called The Psychoanalysis of Satan. <laughs> and the basic premise of the book is that he starts having dreams of trains running along tracks, making sudden right turns, going through tunnels, and he realizes that this dream is actually a wiring diagram for a computer. And he starts writing down his dreams and he builds a computer. And when he turns it on, the computer introduces itself and says, it's Satan. And he just chose to manifest himself on earth in a way that people would find acceptable. I agree that most computers have a direct relationship with Satan. <laughs> and uh, so that's why that book hit. But Psychoanalysis of Satan, it's a paperback. It's well worth a read. It's hilarious. We're going to get introduced to, to the forensic lab. And Donald Rumsfeld, anybody remember him? He, he was a good guy. He got picked on a lot, though. Don't do or say things you would not like to see on the front page of the Washington Post. Good advice for a politician, better advice for a forensic chemist. If you don't want something to come back and haunt you, then don't say something stupid on the stand. When you're called as a witness, make sure you've got your I's dotted and your T's crossed and that everything is in order. Because if you do something stupid, that's the only thing that people are going to remember. <laughs> there was a comedian who said, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. He says, that ain't true. Some things that happen in Vegas are going to turn two next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with what you say on the stand. Be precise. Know your science. Know that you're talking to a group of people that has probably little to no science education. And so you have to be able to relate very complex concepts to them in a way that they understand. That's a simplified way of looking at it. But another statement that he made is you go to war with the army you have, not the army you might want or wish to have at a later time. What's that got to do with forensic labs? Bottom line is, you have to figure out how to conduct the analysis with the instrumentation that you have, not with the instrumentation you wish you had. Ten years ago, drugs were pretty simple. Cocaine could be either in the powder form, which is a hydrochloride salt, or it could be in the base form without the hydrochloride. That sometimes is called crack. Why make crack? Because crack, when heated, volatilizes. You can inhale it. That gets the rush in a lot quicker. If you snort the cocaine, it has to come in through the nose, through the sinuses, actually any of the mucous membranes. And it has to be absorbed and distributed throughout the body before the rush happens. So it's a much gentler episode, much gentler time. Analysis of that is relatively straightforward. Marijuana used to be a big deal. Now it's not a big deal anymore. Quite a few cases we got would always have the marijuana and the active ingredient you're looking for is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol specifically the Delta-9 version of it. Methamphetamine. You know, in, in Southeast Texas, meth was not that big of a deal until about 15 years ago, maybe 20. And then all of a sudden it came in. When we got the submissions there at the Pasadena lab, <clears throat> it was powder cocaine 
we generally knew it came out of Deer Park. If it was crack cocaine, we would generally know it came out of Laporte. It was interesting just how geographic distributions of these drugs happens. Uh, codeine syrup was a big deal there for a while. There's even a type of rap music that I forget the exact name of it, but it's, it sounds like a 78 RPM record played at 33 and a third. It's very droning and very loud and very rhythmic. And it comes from sipping too much codeine syrup with promethazine. Pasadena shares a border with city of Houston in an area where the city of Houston had huge numbers of clinics that were issuing out the codeine and promethazine syrups. Pasadena, they liked their marijuana. They didn't care for the syrup that much. <laughs> Meth is a great drug if you want to age a hundred years and two years. <laughs> It messes your body up pretty bad. <coughs> we also had a tablet cocktail. We called it the uh, Pasadena Trinity. Soma Vicodin Xanax. Standard treatment for pain. Soma is a muscle relaxer called carazoprodol. Vicodin is hydrocodone. It's also Lortab. Uh, that's also hydrocodone. And Xanax, which is a drug called alprazolam, a benzodiazepine type drug related to uh, Valium, which is diazepam. Two thirds of all of our drug impaired driving situations involved Soma Vicodin Xanax. Most of the remaining third involved marijuana and Xanax. Alprazolam, that's infamous there, the X bars. Nowadays, if you buy an Alprazolam tablet on the street, there's probably a better than 75% chance that it's going to contain something other than Alprazolam. What's been happening a whole lot in this Southeast Texas region is that a lot of these medications, they're buying them, they're grinding them up, adding something to dilute them, usually mannitol or inositol, and then repressing tablets. You can buy uh, tablet presses on eBay and on Alibaba and a lot of the different websites, and you can buy the dyes required to make the tablets that, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, a lot of the, the Benzodiazepines that are coming across the, the pond to us now are being used to fill in the fake Alprazolam tablets. And that's things like uh, flu Alprazolam, which means you've attached a fluorine to it. Usually attaching a halogen on this lower section here potentiates the drug. So if you attach a halogen here, that makes the most potent, less potent, and a little less potent. So you can actually kind of regulate the strength. Pharmaceutical chemistry is a wonderful thing. And uh, a lot of the, the guys in the clandestine labs know this stuff. Have interesting things like brotizolam, etizolam, uh, clortizolam, uh, you name it. They've probably got it somewhere. Cares a prodol, it's a muscle relaxer wasn't even regulated as a scheduled substance up until about eight years ago. Now it's a scheduled substance like all the other drugs that uh, you've seen. Traditional instrumentation, the gas chromatograph, workhorse of any analytical lab, especially the big production labs. A good GC is worth its weight in gold. A chemist that knows how to maintain the GC and knows how to make it do its magic is even more valuable <laughs> than a good GC. <laughs> GC, you know the basic theory. You've got a sample that's been solvated. 
that gets put onto the column, moves through the column, based on the type of chemistry you have in the column, it separates into the individual components and will then ultimately come out to a type of detector. The detector you choose depends on what type of analyses you're doing. The most frequent are mass, sens mass sensitive or mass selective de de detectors, hence the GCMS. That is the most common one and they're probably the most useful. Fragmentation patterns are generally unique but we're going to cover a couple of situations where they're so unique that you actually have to use other tests to differentiate similar compounds. Flame ionization detector, uh, that one is used predominantly for alcohol testing. It's used for organic volatiles. Uh, a lot of fire debris analysis used to be by pattern recognition of GCFID. Nowadays, more and more of that's being done by GCMS, so you can actually identify the compounds as well as the patterns. <coughs> Nitrogen phosphorus detector is also very useful, especially in toxicology, because most of the drugs that you're dealing with are going to have PKAs above 8. They're going to be basic drugs. And so having an NPD, nitrogen predominantly, there's not that many with the phosphorus, but nitrogen detector is a very useful thing. It is the most powerful tool, especially in the hands of a competent chemist. <clears throat> GCMS, you should have one GCMS for every two people working in a lab. Ideally though, you would have as many as two GCMSs per person, <laughs> depending upon the volume of stuff that you're getting. Infrared spectroscopy. This is specifically an FTIR, Fourier transform infrared, ATR, attenuated total reflectance. <coughs> Most of the time, FTIR or, F or IR analysis is done by making a little pellet, potassium bromide pellet. Or you could have a, a sodium chloride liquid cell, you have gas cells have different types of cells that you can use. Have any of you ever tried making a pellet? Mm -hmm. uh, was it fun? <laughs> no. no. Please note the rather aggressive <laughs> shaking of the head. Because it has to be so thin that you can see light through it, but not so thin that it breaks when you look through it. <laughs> If it's too thick, you're not going to get enough transmission through there to be able to get a signal. ATR is cool. ATR, you've got a little diamond window right there. You back this up, you put your powder on there, you put this down, you hit it two clicks, that gives it the right amount of pressure, you hit it, the IR comes from underneath through the diamond window and it bounces off the sample. Total sample prep time, two seconds. You can run 8, 16, 32, however many cycles of the spectrum that you want. <coughs> and you get beautiful results. Resolution can sometimes be a little bit awkward if the laser is not properly focused, but overall ATR revolutionized bench top production of by FTIR. I mean it's just it's wonderful. UV visible. A lot of people use the UV for uh, reaction rates. Uh, they do a couple of other things with them. We're using it for a very narrow range of 220 to 340 nanometers, which is where most of the drugs that we deal with have some activity. And that's where they give the results. <clears throat> you can place the, the drug you're dealing with in a, oh, about a two normal or a 0.2 normal sulfuric acid, a one normal hydrochloric acid, or uh, you can actually go into methanol Hexane is actually pretty cool too. 
because hexane actually UV gives you the best information out of the vapor phase and hexane is as close as you can get to the vapor phase without actually being in the vapor phase. So you actually can get some, act some relevant information structurally about the compound that you're dealing with. Additional analytical tools talked about the color test, the microcrystalline tests. <coughs> this over here you see that's cocaine with a gold crystal. This is cocaine platinum crystal. Very distinct under a polarizing light microscope. It's very beautiful. Thin layer chromatography. I don't care how primitive TLC is. It is still one of the most effective techniques for separation that you can possibly have. It's robust, it's cheap, and it actually gives you a way to do a separation so that you can isolate a compound for additional testing. Microscopic examination, most of the things that we're going to be looking at under the microscope, uh, you don't really need that much power unless you're looking at the, the microcrystals where you're probably going to need anything from about 100 magnification to 400. If you're looking for plant characteristics on marijuana, 5 power to 20 power is really all you need. Tablet imprints, these are very good. I, they give you an idea at least of what you might be looking for, but given the number of counterfeit tablets on the street today, probably a third of all prescription tablet cases we get end up being counterfeit. And so that information there is relatively useless at times. We're also generating hundreds of new compounds in the last 10 years. John W. Hoffman worked for Abbott. He was working with cannabinoid receptors. You hear about all the medicinal properties of cannabinoids. They're supposed to be so wonderful, they do all these great things. Well, in your body, right now, we know of two receptors, and there's some people beginning to postulate about a third, possibly even a fourth. But the CB1 receptor is in your nervous system. So if you have a drug that affects the CB1 receptor, that's the thing that gives the high. That's the thing that's going to give you the effect that most people are looking for when they use the marijuana. The funny thing is, marijuana is not even all that powerful. It is only a partial agonist. That means it's not a, it doesn't fully bind to the receptor. It does not give the full benefit of the, the chemical messaging that's going on. And yet it's still pretty effective. <laughs> CB2 is more in the immune system. The idea was that Abbott was going to research the structures of various compounds to see how they interact with CB1 and CB2 receptors because they wanted to develop medications that would affect the CB2 receptor with minimal effect on the CB1. Well, when you do combinatorial chemistry, you're building 90 compounds at once, and you try them on a tissue substrate to see how much their interaction is. Some of the things had no interaction whatsoever. Others had a lot of CB1 potential and no CB2 potential. Others had no CB1 but all CB2, and a lot of them just kind of fell halfway in between. All this information was published. In the last 10 or 15 years, people have been looking at that literature and saying, okay, this one's got good CB1 receptivity. That, ooh, look at that number. And they start building them and they start importing them. And we start seeing them. A lot of times they begin in Romania, Bulgaria, move their way across Europe, 
Sometimes we get them first. There are labs in India and in China that are making these things by the ton, almost literally. John W. Huffman, he said that anybody who uses these things for recreational purposes is a fool. Because we don't know what these things do. They were never intended for human consumption. They were never tested in humans. We don't know short term, let alone long term use of these compounds, what effects they're going to have. So, he said, you're better off just smoking the regular weed. <laughs> okay, defeats the message from a little bit from my perspective. But at the same time, this is a research chemical. How many times do you go into a research lab, by show of hands, and start tasting the chemicals? <laughs> <coughs> I remember we did a, one of the first labs we did in a, in a college uh, setting was making aspirin. That was cool. Boy, did they warn us about not tasting it, not seeing <coughs> if it actually cured a headache. And that's just us making aspirin. And I can imagine some of these other compounds that have a lot more steps involved in the, in the process. <coughs> Cathinones, uh, those all originate from caffeine out of cot, which is an African plant that was chewed for its stimulant effect. Tryptamines, there's one tryptamine you're probably quite familiar with, psilocin, the magic mushrooms, phenylpiprazines. People are kind of interesting. Anytime you have a molecule that's defined by law as illegal, mm -hmm. people start playing Mr. Potato Head and start <laughs> attaching things to that molecule <coughs> and try to see what they can make out of it so that it's legal. And that's what the phenylpiprazines did. Uh, they're actually even taking things like Ritalin, methylphenidate, and they're playing with it and modifying it so that it gets you a better high. <coughs> Fentanyls, you know all about the opioid crisis. Fentanyls are not, not fun. Synthetic opioids, there are research chemicals there as well. A recent alprazolam tablet I got <coughs> had caffeine, big deal, right, cup of coffee. It had a research chemical called U47700, which is an opioid, and it then also had a cathinone in it. What that combination is going to do to somebody, I have not a clue. But it certainly wasn't going to have the antipsychotic effects of alprazolam. Synthetic opioids, and who knows what else? These are the things we know about. And quoting Donald Rumsfeld once more time, there are known knowns. There are things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know that we don't know. And sometimes it's serendipity that you find out about them. Other times somebody else has found out and they let you know. One of the most crucial things in any forensic laboratory system is exchange of ideas and information. Somebody is seeing something in North Texas that we may not be seeing here in Southeast Texas. <clears throat> There's also a Yahoo group for CLIC, Clandestine Laboratory Investigating Chemists. That, if you are an organic chemistry nerd, is organic chemistry nerd's heaven. <laughs> Synthetic cannabinoids. <clears throat> Talked a little bit about the theory of them before. These were a couple of things that came out about 10 years ago. They were very popular for about a three to six month period and then they disappeared because other ones showed up on the market. Originally the law tried to define the name as being illegal. Well then 
what's the difference between here and here? Well, so we just put a fluorine onto the end of that rascal. That potentiates it and makes it more interesting. <coughs> so the law reacted to this, so we introduced this. It's now more potent, and it's legal. <laughs> So what Texas has done is they have made the synthetic cannabinoids illegal as a matter of structure and components of a structure rather than as a specific compound. They have three groups of things. Effectively this molecule consists of four groups. This is the core, this is the tail, this is the connector, and this is what they call the group A. There are about, <clears throat> about 15 structures that are defined as core groups. Indoles, indazoles. Uh, imagine pretty much anything with a double or a triplic, triple cyclic core, generally with a nitrogen in one or two places. The law further stipulates that they have to be substituted at certain points. <coughs> there are about 10 compounds that are listed for a connector that, uh, if attached at one of the specified points on the core, and then there are about 12 or so compounds that are going to be able to be attached out here. And so those are all defined, and so as people play around and create new things, they're already covered. We don't worry about this part down here, <clears throat> because the main binding is taking place across here. And that area is also the area that has created the most problems for the analyst, because you have to identify... <clears throat> using the instrumentation that you have, which for most labs is a GCMS. <clears throat> that fluorine could just as well be attached in the four position, in the three, the two, or the one. And by mass spec, that's not a very easy separation. The GC retention time does give you some clues. One of the other difficulties you end up with is that a three ring cyclic is not very stable thermally and it breaks open on analysis. Fortunately the core molecule is stable enough that the amount of byproduct that you get with a broken open cyclopropyl area <clears throat> isn't a significant loss. So if you're not quantitating, it's not really a major effect. So GCMS is still your best analytical answer. Secondary propyl group, cyclopropyl group opening up is explainable and is not a, generally a significant loss of the compound, the parent compound. You can do some minor separation of the isomers uh, by GC, but that then requires that you have standards for all of them and that you run regular standards, which then takes more time. FTIR is another good answer, but normally you're getting this stuff sprayed into potpourri. Most of the time you see this stuff, like uh, K2 or spice or uh, uh, Scooby Snacks, or any of the other different names that they give these things. It has a plant material base. And then they take the synthetic cannabinoid, mix it with acetone, mix it with some organic solvent. They have a big cement mixer. They throw about 100 pounds of plant material in there. And then they spray with a plant sprayer that who knows if they used that for insect spray the night before. 
They spray the stuff in there, let it tumble around, then they dump it out on the floor, let it air dry, and then they mix it up and they put it into bags, and they say you're getting 10 grams. Having analyzed numerous bags, if you're buying 10 grams, you're getting shortchanged because very seldom is there more than 7 grams and there's almost never more than 9 grams present in those bags. So their quality control is lacking. <laughs> Who'd have thought that would be the case with, uh, with a clandestine lab, right? Uh, if we're dreaming NMR, there's some nice tabletop NMRs coming available. I just, I just don't want to build the Faraday cage to house it and I don't know. It's just <laughs> So by under Texas law, the flooring position doesn't matter. But what that's done is that's allowed us to use the GCMS without worrying about the retention time because generally speaking, it's only the flooring in the five position that's going to be available. Uh, I think that, that having the the flooring in the one position is not even chemically possible, I believe. And then two, three, and four are difficult, I believe, is the way that uh, it was explained. Uh, but since we don't worry about that so much anymore. So the problems, thermal degradation, thermal rearrangement. An injector in a GCMS is going to be between 150 and 250 degrees for most of the analyses that we perform. So thermal degradation and thermal considerations are very important because you don't want your parent molecule to decompose. Isomers, there are a lot of molecules that are very, very similar that are very similar on the mass spec. And this was primarily, I, I did this presentation recently for uh, uh, another group and there weren't any chemists in the in the bunch so I put this in there for them uh, if you haven't had organic chemistry yet learn this <laughs> learn it well we're going to take another quick look THC THC normally we get that as a plant material uh, the dried plant substance sometimes you get fresh plants but nowadays there are different things that are being done to it. The wax, you've got uh, the butanol extractions, you've got these weird critical liquid extractions that are being take, that are taking place in the field where they're separating the THC resin from the plant material. Other times they're taking the keef and keef is when they dr grind up the plant material, it makes a very, very fine powder, makes a more uniform uh, pieces of plant material for smoking purposes. They have a little sieve in that grinder so that some of the high THC continent or containing uh, portions of the plant can fall through that sieve and gather in a little tray at the bottom. And that's usually the, the pistils and the uh, glandular hair that grows on the leaf that exudes the, the THC resin. And those have very high concentrations. So they have this very, very fine powder. And so what they'll do is they'll either get a, a rolling paper that has an adhesive on the outside and they'll roll that through the keef. So they're getting not only the THC from the plant material they're smoking, but they're adding five to 10% from adding the keef. Normal THC content 10 to 15 years ago was probably less than 3%. Between hydroponic, hybridization, selective breeding things, we are now getting plants that can have as much as 20% THC content. And you can imagine by concentrating this stuff, uh, the shatter especially can be up to about 40, I've heard even a 50%. It used to be said that you can't overdose on marijuana. 
that may have been true when it was one to three percent. Hospitals are reporting a large number of overdose subjects coming to the emergency room and they're doing this stuff is called it's dabbing is the name that I've heard for it. And they have an electronic smoking device, so basically a vape cartridge, and it has a little basket and you put some of this waxy goo on there and you heat it up and you inhale the vapors of it. So now rather than getting something that's four, five, six percent, you're getting something that's 30 to 40 percent. Some years ago there was a story in the paper about an individual in Florida who was eating the face of a homeless person and they thought that he had been overdosed on bath salts the cathinones, because that was the big fear at the time. About three months later, the news story came out, no, he was doing some of this hybridized marijuana and with the special concentration techniques, and he had just gone completely and totally schizophrenic. And was just, his mind was melted. The problem is that in most plant material, THC is not in the THC form. It's in the acid form. When the plant material dries, it decarboxylates and becomes THC. There are three THC acids that are possible. This is the THC acid A, THC acid B, and the one that gets up here is actually called an 11 nor carboxy THC which is the primary urinary metabolite for THC that's what they're using for when they do a tinkle test so the problem is when you get the shatter or the wax the chances are that the parent compound of what you are looking at is in the acid form if you then prepare the sample as you normally would for a THC analysis this is what you're going to get by GCMS because at the injector it decarboxylates and becomes the basic form so what do you have to do <clears throat> well fortunately the concentration of the THC acid is high enough that you can use FTIR as an analysis. Especially that ATR. Runs through them, wonderful stuff. Then you go to UV and you put a, a small sample into methanol and you get a very distinct UV pattern that is different from the THC pattern. Now you've shown by two separate tests that you have THC acid present and not the THC. Most importantly though, I've said this once, I'll say it again, derivatization. <clears throat> There's a chemical called BSTFA, There's another one called MSTFA. It makes a trimethylsilyl derivative of the compound at an acidic proton. So on the THC acid are you going to get mono or di substitution? You have two very acidic protons here at the hydroxy, here at the carboxy. It's going to replace those and give you a trimethylsilyl derivative. The THC, boom, only one. <coughs> You run your standards. Normally what I found is that if my FTIR showed me that I had THC acid, then I get a beautiful peak for THC acid di-TMS. As a single peak, there was nothing else there. This is the THC acid in methanol by UV, and that's the THC by UV. Furthermore, when it was just plant material, it was delta-9. 
THC. That was it. Now, with all the vape cartridges and with all the other synthetic stuff that's being made, now we're running into not just Delta 9, but you got the Delta 8, Delta 10, the Delta 6A, 10A. They're all still regulated by law, but you as a chemist still have to identify the parent compound. So, quick mental notes. You've got photographic recall, right? <laughs> <coughs> all right, there you go. There's a Delta 9. That's the fragmentation pattern. Note the retention time. <clears throat> We're now moving on to the Delta 8. Note the fragmentation pattern. Note the retention time. <clears throat> this one's going to be, yeah, your Delta 10. Note fragmentation pattern. Note retention time. And that's your 6A, 10A. The first few times we saw this in the lab, the computer library wanted to tell us that because it had a 292 and a 242, that it was coding. <laughs> it ain't coding! We had plant material, not syrup. So using the, the, the traditionally accepted instrumentation, we, uh, we're still able to solve that problem and get the right answer. Uh, this one was a particularly devastating. Alexander Shulgin. Name familiar? Alexander Shulgin is a very interesting chemist in that he developed a whole myriad of phenethylamines and then he tried them on himself and his wife. He was a psychedelic chemist. That was his big deal. And he liked the stimulant effects, he liked the hallucinogenic effects. Alexander Shogun created a whole series of phenethylamines. The 2C series is very good. There are a couple of books that you can get if you're a very curious organic uh, tinkerer. PCAL, phenethylamines I have known and loved. TCAL, tryptamines I have known and loved. He gives his recipes, he gives his cooking instructions, and he gives dosing instructions for how they made him feel. So half the book is about how he felt under the influence, and the other half of the book is about how to make the stuff. PCAL and TCAL, it's on Amazon, you can't mix it. <laughs> You can also get the Shulgin Compendium if you want the real book on the, the true analysis stuff. Well, one of the things that came, these are known as the Enbows. The Enbows are an offshoot of the N-bombs. And you see they're all related to the 2C compound, right? You see the structural similarity? Well, what happened, N-bombs came on because LSD was hard to get. They needed a hallucinogen. They came out with this stuff. It's generally available as a pink crystalline material or as a pink liquid or on blotter paper. Became illegal. So what do they do? They remove a methyl group and leave a hydroxy group. Now you have an n bo a lot of people didn't know that when an NBO is analyzed by GCMS, it separates and you get a single peak for 2CI or 2CB, depending upon which halogen you have. It would be 2CF. <coughs> and it was by pure accident that somebody had a DART, which is a direct analysis, real-time mass spec, and they got a different mass spec pattern than people were getting who were going through a GC first. And that's when they realized how sensitive that little peak is there. So what do you have to make a state a peak or to have a compound become stable? 
so that you can analyze it and identify the parent compound. Derivatization. Acidic proton. Acidic proton. You can attach a TMS, a trimethylsilyl there, and you get a nice stable peak if you've identified the parent. The main thing is that you also have a second test by UV. And the UV is the thing that always had been confusing because there were some people who got the analysis and said, hey, uh, my second test doesn't give me the same information. <coughs> and they said, well, put that aside until we can figure it out. This is one situation where having the greatest instrumentation in the world does nobody any good if you don't know what you're doing. That's probably a little bit strong. They knew what they were doing. They just misinterpreted what they did. But there's a major federal lab that identified NBOs as two C compounds, made a false positive identification, and they had NMR. <laughs> so they should have known better. So derivatization prevents the thermal rearrangement and allows identification. Uh, <coughs> this is where the confusion came in. This is the NBO in acetonitrile, and there's the NBOM in, a, in the, uh, the 2CI compound in the... Uh, so yeah, different enough that you would say that's not the same thing. <coughs> Uh, we're not going to go through, yeah, this one's kind of, isomers are a problem, especially when they can co-elute by GC, and you don't necessarily always have the option of derivatization. Uh, to say that sometimes the detailed information is still available by regular GC or GCMS, but you have to look for it. Here it comes down to pattern recognition and pattern identification. If you look at the little tri, little, peak, little group of three ions, 70, 71, 72, if you have the n ethyl penalone, the 70 is always going to be a little bit taller than the 71 and 2. The NN dimethyl penalone which has effectively the same retention time where you're not going to really be able to do it without some computer wizardry. The 71 is always going to be at least twice as tall as the 70 and the 72. So that's how you can separate those isomers. Uh, probably bored with isomers, meth and phenamine. You can see that a lot of structures that are similar and this is one of those where spot tests help you out and where IR helps you, UV won't, mass spec uh, by retention time ever so slightly. Uh, this one, psilocin versus bufotenine. This is the tryptamine class. Uh, psilocin is from magic mushrooms. Bufotenine is uh, the, to uh, the toad. The toad lickers. It's a hallucinogen that comes from licking toads. Generally, the problem there isn't the fact that somebody made a tea out of mushrooms, but the fact that they're submitting a toad. <laughs> I, that to me is a problem. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't react well to toads. <laughs> but there again, your traditional methods work. Sharing of information, I can't emphasize it enough, sharing information is critical. If you run into something you don't know, good golly, go ask somebody. The Click website is one of the most useful sites for identifying unknowns. There is in, um, in Latvia, there is a website that helps them with identification of some of these new SIMCANs and the new opioids that are coming out. They have a, a combination forensic lab system along with an academic lab system 
that when these new things come out, they can characterize the molecules with three different uh, types of mass spec, and they can do the NMRs, they can do a CNMR, they can do an HNMR, they can do all these things, they characterize the molecule, describe it, and booyah, there's that information. Now you have it validated and use that information. It's called European response. You can take a look at it. When I first looked at that, that table of molecules about five years ago, they had 40. They now have over 800. That's how fast this field is growing. And don't be afraid to try more than one technique, especially if you know that that technique is going to be able to give you some different information that will help you differentiate an isomer, help you differentiate a parent compound from another. The worst thing you can do is make a wrong call. That is the worst thing you can do because that's your reputation that's over and done with at that point, but you're also hurting the lab that you're working in. And the best instrumentation does not guarantee the best results. That lab with the NMR missed the NBOs completely. And then they had the audacity to say that nobody had ever told them about it. And they had hosted a meeting where one of our chemists went up and explained the whole NBO situation. And the person who was investigating the erroneous report when they heard that, they said, do you have a copy of the meeting? Uh, and he said, yeah. Could you send that to me, please? It's always important to keep, especially if you're doing a presentation. It's important to keep memos and things that show the meeting you attended and when, because sometimes they can come back to bite you in the keister. <laughs> and when, when a lab manager is lying to an investigator that they'd never heard of this before and we've got something that they authorized to be published a meeting agenda doesn't look good consider the three umpires three baseball umpires it's appropriate right now go Strohs uh, I'm not prejudiced the three umpires are standing around talking and the one umpire says I call it what it is. Second umpire says, no, I, I, I call them the way I see them. The third umpire says, they ain't nothing until I call them. <laughs> and that's probably the biggest truth to learn. That until that report comes out, that is still an alleged cocaine or suspected cocaine. When your report comes out, it is cocaine. And it better not be meth. And I thank you so very much for your kind attention. Um, so I was really curious. You, you, you mentioned that it was really complicated to, to isolate the THC acid because of the decarboxylation problem. What's the consequence of that? Like if you just misidentify something as THC that was really THC acid. <coughs> it gets reported the same way as a, a generic tetrahydrocannabinols. <coughs> the question is actually then more about the integrity of the chemist because you've actually technically you've misidentified the parent compound. Uh, you've still identified a controlled substance, but technically you didn't identify the substance that was actually present. The consequences depend upon the court. It's sad to say many times these cases don't go to court. Someone is just tired of sitting in jail, they'll take a plea and be done with it. And so sometimes the best work of the best chemist is overlooked. But I think that the identification of the THC acid comes down to knowing the form that it would appear in and having the integrity to look, knowing that it's going to take a couple of extra steps. So rather than trying to rush through it and get an answer, 
you're trying to get the right answer. And it's kind of ironic, part of the accreditation process, part of the teaching process, is they make you sit through courses on ethics. <laughs> and then when there's a situation like, if you call it THC, when it was actually THC acid, which is an obvious ethics issue, they seem to look the other way. And I hate seeing that. This is a question of ethics. Your reputation is the only thing that gets you through there. It's what gets you, gives credibility to your results. So take the extra steps, know the form that these things take, and know that you're going to need to do an extra step. Kind of a long roundabout way of saying, just do what's right. Um, and you talk about things going to court. How often have you served as a, an expert witness? For breath alcohol, about 600 times. For controlled substance, about two dozen. For toxicology, 10 to 20 times. Rough estimates. Breath alcohol, blood alcohol tend to be the most heavily contested types of cases in court. And most of the time that's because the juries figure, you know, that could have been me. And so they seem to have a personal involvement. Funniest one I ever saw, gentleman tested a .25 alcohol, which is, you know, in .08 is the cutoff between legally intoxicated, which is actually a misnomer, because Texas law also says that you are intoxicated if you have lost the normal use of your mental or physical faculties by reason of introduction of alcohol, drug, controlled substance, or any combination of two or more, or any other substance, into the body. So that means if you are taking Benadryl, because you've got allergies really, really bad, and Benadryl makes you sleepy, and you go out and drive, you can be charged with DWI under Texas law. That also is true if you have a prescription med that your doctor takes, tells you to take. And anyway, this gentleman tested a .25. Isn't that legally dead? I don't, I don't it, for some people, yeah. <laughs> uh, but a lot of the, what we see in, in the individuals, the more experienced drinkers, is that they train like Olympic athletes. <laughs> You know, if a 12 knocks you out this time, then next weekend we shoot for 15. And, you know, around 3.0, 3.5 is where you begin seeing uh, mortality rates increase pretty quickly. And yet the highest reported alcohol concentration I've ever seen is like a 1.6 grams of ethanol per 100 milliliters of blood. So it's a Japanese fisherman that got caught in a typhoon and they figured they were gonna die, so they drank everything that they had on board. <laughs> and so the next morning, the Japanese Coast Guard found their boat adrift, life flighted them, then dialysis was given, and they got them down off of that alcohol concentration pretty quickly, and they actually saved their lives. But this .25 fella comes to court wearing his Metro bus driver uniform Ooh. with his safe driver award over here on the shoulder, little patch sewn on. The jury did not take kindly <laughs> to that. Uh, that. That was not seen as a good thing. Uh, there's, but yeah, there are a lot of stories and one of the things you'll find if you get into the forensic science, most of those stories involve bodily fluids. <laughs> uh, there was a fellow who got pulled over for doing about 70, 75 on Memorial. <clears throat> First of all, they called in an accident reconstruction specialist. There was no accident who actually did calculations to prove that it was impossible to do 75 on Memorial. I don't know if any of you have ever driven on Memorial, 
but let me assure you that it's very possible <laughs> to do 75, especially when the, the police are not out. Um, be careful around that turn near Gessner when you go past the Village Police Department. And uh, yeah, but bottom line, uh, they asked the uh, the uh, officer on the stand, said, "Can you recognize the person you arrested that night?" And he says, "Yeah, that's him right there." And he pointed to him. And so he, he did that. That's a typical part of a DWI that you have to identify the individual you arrested that night. And then they came back about five more times and says, can you identify that person you arrested that night? He says, that's him. And so when the prosecutor got a chance to ask questions again, says, you know, I know you've answered this question numerous times. <coughs> and you've been absolutely rock solid in pointing out that individual. What about that evening makes you so confident that that's the person you arrested? What was so memorable about that person? He says, well, when I pulled him over, when I finally got him to stop, I came up beside uh, the window, when the window rolled down, I saw that, on the, uh, that he was sitting butt naked on the front seat with an open jar of Vaseline and an open bottle of Jack Daniels in the passenger seat. At which point the defense attorney's mouth went, <laughs> it was like a cartoon. Eyes bugged out, and jaw hit the table. And he looks at his client, and his client goes. <laughs> <laughs> and the attorney at that point stands up and says, Your Honor, I think we'd like to change our plea at this time. <laughs> they, they, get, they, get, they get interesting. <laughs> they get interesting. And if you, they want them to be gruesome, talk to somebody that works at the ME's office sometime. What happens in those autopsy rooms and what you can do with various body parts. No, that's unfit for mixed company. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it is sometimes very gruesome. That's why I like doing drugs. You don't generally get to deal with body fluids. You just get pills, powders, and plants. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> yes, ma'am? question. Um, so you mentioned earlier the story about that guy who got essentially schizophrenia because he took that bath. And then I know that I was doing rotations at a psychiatric ward for a little bit. And there were some patients that were there um, like the onset of like, I suppose like a temporary psychosis was like taking Kush. So I was wondering if there are any like drugs that actually cause like psychological damage or like permanent like psychosis. Every drug has different effects on different people. Uh, one of the big drugs that you probably encountered in a psych ward would be haloperidol, haldol. Some people it knocks out, other people it almost acts as a stimulant. It's more common that it acts as a, as a knockout. Uh, speaking for myself personally, uh, I have had a very bad experience with Sudafed. Sudafed is an over-the-counter antihistamine, basically. <clears throat> that's always in the non-drowsy formula, cold medicines. Ephedrine is in the NyQuil and such, and they're, they're stereoisomers of one another. And the ephedrine does cause drowsiness and all that. Sudafed normally doesn't. Me, it knocks me on my keister. I'm out for the night if I take a Sudafed. So every person is different. So yet, it's, when you're treating someone whose brain chemistry is already a little bit messed up, adding another chemical to that equation doesn't always do what's desired. Uh, a friend of mine, his wife had schizophrenia and no drug ever seemed to work for more than three or four months before they had to change it because the brain got accustomed to it and said, okay, normally I'm screwed up, so when this stuff's present, I'll be screwed up again. Which is not a very technical explanation, but that's basically the way it worked in her case. So yeah, every drug works differently in every person. So yeah, it's entirely possible. Sometimes, a physician tries to do no harm, 
but we don't know how that medication is going to behave in that person and unintentionally they end up doing harm. There, there's a uh, lab springing up that are testing uh, medicinal marijuana mm -hmm. and I'm a little confused because state law you know, is saying one thing and federal law is saying something else and you know if I were to work in a lab like that am I taking any legal risks or anything? Or? It is a confusing mess of laws you <laughs> are correct <clears throat> Those labs that test the marijuana for medicinal purposes, they quantitate the, uh, the THC, the THC acid, the cannabidiol, the cannabinol, the cannabigerol, the cannabichromine. There are about 80 different cannabinoids that are present in any potential plant. The labs that operate in the states where it is legal as medicinal marijuana or for recreational purposes. Those labs have those obligations to make that determination of what the concentrations are because they sell them. Because the marijuana is still technically illegal on a federal level, a lot of banks are not willing to take the money from these places which are cash cows. No one's gonna pay with a credit card and then drive back to Texas with their medicinal marijuana. Mm -hmm. is, I mean, that's just too easy to trace. Mm -hmm. So they have all this cash on hand and the banks won't take it. So now they begin robbing each other. So that's created another hazard for the citizens that thought they were getting medicinal marijuana or recreational use. One of the other things that's also happening is because of the government regulation on those legal smoke shops it's cheaper to buy marijuana on the street from a guy who's growing it illegally. And so, okay, so you don't have this fancy container, but you get just as high. So in Texas right now, marijuana is still illegal. They just introduced a new hemp law so that cannabis, sativa, lanai, and hemp, which is cannabis, sativa, lanai, are effectively the same plant. The legal definition, the difference is that the hemp must have 0.3% THC or less. There's no lab in the state of Texas that is yet geared up to address that new law. Mm -hmm. So all of the prosecutions for possession of marijuana have come to a standstill across the state mm -hmm. until that quantitation can be set up and uh, put into place. Mm. So what's that going to ultimately do? Well, every guy that had a baggie of buds that they knew was Acapulco Gold or Puff the Magic Dragon or, or Purple Dragon or Skywalker OG or any of the other different types that they're marketing, is suddenly when he comes to court, no, that's him. <laughs> no, you weren't going to smoke rope. You, know, you, you don't take buds to, to make rope. That's not the way it works. <laughs> but until you have that lab result on the table, it says that it's more than 0.3% THC. Legally, it's hemp. Mm. That's the three umpire thing. Mm. There, there's a, a plant that's going to work up in, in Houston. They're going to um, process hemp. And they're gonna make things yes. Like so how are they certifying that, that what's coming in the plant really is hemp? Not there are licensing things that are going to be in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you possess the hemp, you have to possess the tax stamp that goes with it. Mm -hmm. And the tax certificate, there's going to be things that are going to have to be done, uh, including having a lab analysis that says that it's 0.3% or less. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Uh, it's, they thought it was going to be a good thing for the state of Texas. But ultimately what you're gonna find, I think, is that it's not gonna generate the revenue that they thought it would. And I think that's what they've seen at, um, in Colorado. Uh, they initially, they weren't seeing much effect on traffic DWIs. They're seeing more and more traffic DWIs and accidents that are marijuana related.
Mm. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are happening that are unintended consequences of making the things legal. Mm. Um, it's the same thing you would expect. Alcohol is legal. People are going to drive drunk, period. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Marijuana. You know, you, you run out of... Uh, what was the uh, the joke about the Olympics? One of the snowboarders, Ross Rodriati from Canada. Yeah, well, th this was actually more of a joke. Mm. Uh, they, <laughs> I know that they had a real one that where he got the the fine for having the marijuana in the system. And well, the joke was that they took away his medal because it was a performance enhancing drug. And they're looking at him <laughs> says marijuana is a performance enhancing drug. I mean, most people get really mellow when they smoke the marijuana. He says, yeah, but they put the snack bar at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, marijuana can be a performance enhancing drug. So. Do we have any other questions for our speaker? If not, um, the ACS would like to thank you and this is the International Year of the Periodic Table with wow, a thank you. periodic table cutting board and the Greater Houston section would like to honor you with thank a you Greater much. Houston section pin. That so, is so cool. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming to speak with us. Love everybody listening. Thank you. Thank you.